The concept of distributing music but not making money when it sells in the music industry, are you kidding? That's what the music industry is, is and has been for you know 80 to 100 and some odd years. We as record labels make money when the music sells. We editorially select what you let in. And, uh, and then once we do that, we place bets, we attempt to make the artist famous, and we capitalize on that fame by making money off of it. There's nothing wrong with that. Technology created scalability, and technology created mass communication, and technology created infinite shelf space, and technology created inventory that's unlimited that replicates on demand with no upfront cost. And once you have all of that, you have a perfect storm and go, well, wait a second, why not take the song file that's sitting on my, my hard drive and put it on an Apple's hard drive instead and make it available in the retail <coughs> store where people go to buy music right? and switch the model. I won't make money when it sells, I'll only make money uh, by being paid an upfront fee for service. It labels make subjective decisions, work for the everybody else, of which there are tens of millions of them around the world. And my goal and job, I view it, is to provide opportunity, education, information, and access <laughs> to the people that use us. Right. Technology now allows me to do that and scale uh, in a way that w it was never done before. As a matter of fact, it's made, made the music industry more efficient. Even the traditional music industry, we talk about a decrease in revenue even though unit sales are up, but the reality is you don't need to manufacture inventory that doesn't sell. You don't get returns. Co-op dollars don't exist anymore because you don't need to buy your way onto the iTunes shelf. So really, the gross margins are better on releases than they've ever been before. And if you can adjust the economics of the traditional label system to accommodate what technology has provided, you'll find a much better, much more efficient system where everybody can win. Some of the challenges that we faced were um, sort of what Jeff embraced. Um, so we, we, we wanted to resist. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for the physical product and for a static recording. But what we had to, uh, the challenges we had was resisting uh, the infinite shelf space and, the, and the, the ability to scale and to work with artists to help them uh, you know, create still a sense of urgency and bring back excitement to live. When you understand the relationship between an artist and a fan, there needs to be romance between that. And so you can't get an artist whenever you want them. And so right now, we do have the ability to to go to Google and pretty much get everything. The only thing you can't get is them in the live moment. So what we're allowing an artist to do is to extend on that and use technology to say, hey, you can find me here, but I'm here just for a short bit. And when it's over, this moment is gone. Part of what we're disrupting, frankly, is less about an industry and more about a media, media genre. So I mean, historically, the way that people found out what's happening in their local market was very print-based. So. Um, you know, I know my own behavior is a Sunday morning, I sit down at my breakfast joint on Highway 101 and read through the reader and find out about all the things that I missed that weekend. Um, you know, it, because it, because it came, out, came out on Thursday and it was, you know, by Friday, by Sunday morning, everything that was interesting over the weekend had come and gone. And I think that's a fairly common phenomenon in a print-based world where um, you're, you're relying on, you know, print as a, as a relatively slow and medium that really requires a lot of lead time. So what we've done for about 20 million consumers now who have, we have about 16 million registered users and then a bunch of, you know, additional users who are not registered. So for 16 million people, we've learned where they are, who they are, age and gender, but more importantly, what they like. And our technology is very focused on personalization. Every communication, whether it's through our iPhone app or our other mobile apps or email programs or the website are personalized down to an individual user's um, behavior level. So you're actually getting notified in advance through pushed communication through emails and, and so forth of the things that map to your interests. Everyone is on information overload. And when it comes to entertainment, how do you cut through that clutter? Um, and so by personalizing that experience and tuning our recommendations and our content to each individual user, um, that has been breakthrough for us. First, first and foremost, we take it from the framework of what's going to work with the, with the consumer um, and where the consumer's headed and making sure that we provide those types of experiences. You know, we've done a number of partnerships with some of the major portals like a MSN and AOL. So what we found was um, when you actually are providing some, some lead-in information, some behind the, 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 behind the stage, backstage type of uh, access, and editorially put some context behind it, that's what really drove things forward. Um, and it wasn't just getting that content out there. And I think a lot of the stuff that uh, TuneCore is doing with, uh, with getting, promoting artists out there, uh, is very similar to what we've, we've been driving forward in terms of video content and, and games and applications. It's really, that's, that's what makes the difference. It's not about just getting, getting 
content out there. It's making sure that people are proactively um, communicating that and leveraging to the blog community and into people's social net networks. So what we did was um, we, w we went and did blanket deals with Universal, EMI, uh, In Grooves, The Orchard. Uh, we've got about four million songs up right now. Uh, and you can literally go and take songs for free, and the artists will get paid the same way as iTunes, like identically. The difference is McDonald's is paying them, or Pepsi, or Sprite. You can literally come to our site and go, well, do I want Sprite to pay for it, McDonald's to pay for it, or Jack in the Box to pay for it? You still get it, the artist still gets paid, the label gets paid, and uh, I, I mean, we encourage artists to, Send, if I was an artist and I got paid every time someone took a free song off of a site, I would just be sending people there 24-7. I think the model they've come up with to work on the advertising thing is actually one of the better models I've seen to get artists paid. Right. Because people are stealing music all day. Why not go there and get it for free and still get the artist paid? That's the idea. When I was 12 years old, you know, and I was just at my mom's in Chicago, and I was looking, flipping through it, I, you know, I had 25, 30 artists in my vinyl collection. And now the same 12, 13 year olds have 2,000, 4,000 artists in their digital libraries. So on the flip side, you've got more supply. So you've got fragmented taste, you've got you know, much more supply. And so from a live music perspective, I, I, the reason that the tracking that you're seeing is going down is because that tracking is very centric around larger venues that are part of the, uh, you know, the installed base of the industry. And what we see at Eventful, when we, we, we did a comparison of live music events in August of 2010 versus August of 2009 and saw a 28% increase in the number of live music events year over year, which is a huge increase. Um, and we, we looked at the number of artists who were in demand in August of 2010 versus August 2009. And there was like an 18% increase. Again, a huge increase in the spectrum and breadth of which artists were in demand and holding live music events. So, there's, it, it's a golden age in terms of variety and plentitude of live music events. It's just the, again, the, the you know, when you look at sheds and auditoriums and well, big, I think big amphitheaters, it's, it's harder to fill those, but go to the Elbow Room in Chicago right. that holds 125 or 175 people, and they're full seven nights a week. There are more ways for people to engage, interact, share music, listen, create playlists. I mean, this is good for music. The challenge that we're having is how do we monetize all this in a way that's equitable and fair for everyone? And we're, we're going through a shift, and that's okay. But goddamn, this is exciting. I mean, just look at DMCA compliant streams. Digital Millennium Copyright Act streams. So for those of you that don't know, when your music is streamed on Pandora or Last.fm or Django or Slacker or 8-Tracks, uh, as an example, non-terrestrial based streams, that makes you money. You know how much? Between 2002 to 2008, it's a half a billion dollars in revenue. Half a billion dollars. The RIAA itself from 2004 to 2008 has a new line listing on its year-end statistics that show DMCA-compliant streams moving from $6.4 million in 2004 to $155 million a mere four years later. That's because people can engage with music now, and the songwriters and the publishers and the public performers and the artists, they're all getting paid, and the labels as well.